And I was just saying the best way to watch Zoom meetings, in my opinion, is in gallery mode, because you get to see the whole crew. All right, 10 seconds. This is exciting. We're live. We're live. OK, and are we recording too? Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Cosmic. Um, we're recording and streaming. And our name is the Collective Open Source Medical Innovations for COVID-19 Cosmic Group. And we're all volunteering in our mission to create medical equipment uh, in BC and around the world through open source uh, design solutions. And so please uh, visit our website at cosmicmedical.ca to learn more. And I'm just going to share my screen at this point uh, so that I have uh, some information here. And excuse me, just a little technical difficulties. So now I'm sharing my screen. Uh, and we're, there we go. Do you guys see my screen? Take that as a yes. So we are Cosmic, as I said. Please check out our website. Uh, you'll be able to learn more about us as an organization, see our projects, learn how you can donate, and most importantly, join Cosmic. And that's also the place where you can find uh, our um, designs, open source project designs that are now available on GitHub. So now let's go ahead and uh, I would like everyone to switch into gallery mode. And uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can all uh, say hello to each other, um, which is a bit of our tradition here. So give everyone a wave. Um, it's wonderful to see everyone here. Uh, I'm going to encourage all of us to take three deep breaths uh, on my lead, just so that we can try to be present uh, in, in this space, virtual space together. So if you guys wanna follow me in taking three deep breaths, that would be great. So take a deep breath in and out and try to leave all those concerns at the door and then breathe in and out and now breathe in and out. Awesome, great work everyone. So now that we're in gallery mode, uh, we're gonna have our nice little tradition uh, where we're gonna just smile, wave and I'm gonna just take a, a nice screenshot for all of us here. So let's do that on the count of three. One, two, three. Awesome. And I'm going to do one more because we have two screens worth. One, two, three. Good. Awesome. So um, in terms of the what we're going to do today, uh, we're going to start off uh, with, uh, now that we've welcomed everyone, uh, I wanted to say that we're gathered here today for our monthly update meeting. And the purpose is really to build community with each other, share the work that we're doing uh, with the world and also get feedback about our current uh, projects and future strategic directions. So in terms of what we're going to be covering today in our meeting, um, we're going to start with an introduction of our experts and special guests. We're gonna to move to a cosmic community update You'll hear from Chris and myself about that. You'll hear an update about our international outreach. Then we'll dive deep into some biomedical engineering team updates. We're gonna hear from Gvent, Bubble Helmet, clinical respiratory support. And then most, uh, what's gonna be really exciting is we're gonna get some feedback uh, and as well as a presentation from Mr. Mike Paddock, who's joining us today. And he's the chief engineer for Engineers Without Borders USA and has been advising the UN development program vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19. And then we're going to wrap up with a general uh, question and kind of Q and A uh, for uh, with um, with the entire organization. And then before we're all done, we're going to and then that that'll be the end of the actual meeting. And then from there, we will go into uh, an informal meet and greet uh, breakout group uh, session where we can meet each other. So we have uh, with us today, as I said, Mr. Paddock, and uh, he will be making a presentation. And I also wanted to um, take a moment to welcome our new Cosmic uh, team members that have joined uh, our group in the last month. They include Ray and Bosch, uh, Janelle Patel, Eric Bilgen, Delea Gamma, um, as well as uh, um, Eric, David, Peter, Michael, and Yusuto. 
And without any further ado, I'm now going to ask uh, uh, Dr. Chris Guan to give us an update about how things are going at Cosmic. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Phil, and welcome everyone uh, back to the Cosmic Design Meeting. I just want to say hello to all our longtime members as well as all our new members and our invited guests. As usual, I'd like to uh, express my gratitude to everyone for uh, becoming a part of the organization and helping push everything along. As you know, we started in March with just the three of us uh, co-founding the unit and then growing uh, very quickly into uh, in size almost to 200 members and whittling away slowly as COVID has allowed us, uh, COVID re uh, relief has allowed us to uh, get back to somewhat normal activities, including school and work. And so that has had a profound effect on the, on the existing core membership of COSMIC and yet uh, COSMIC has still seen its way to progress forward in any number of ongoing designs uh, new form, new design uh, creation, as well as ongoing marketing, distribution, outreach uh, efforts. And that's through the efforts of many of the members that you see on your screen right now. Uh, one of those people of note is uh, Stanley Lee. He's been really the meat and potatoes of the organization, holding a lot of these groups together, leading meetings, organizing uh, sessions, maintaining contacts, and really uh, keeping his finger on the pulse of whatever's going on in and maintaining uh, any number of, uh, of uh, contact points and documentation to, to really keep us uh, moving forward. And, uh, and uh, we're not saying goodbye to Stanley, but Stanley uh, deservedly needs to step back a bit and uh, see to uh, his own work. And I'd like to specifically single him out today for uh, much thanks from Cosmic, the organization. And uh, we'll be hearing a little bit more about uh, our needs as an organization in terms of being able to backfill Stanley's uh, large shoes that he's that he's about to empty. But um, thank you, Stanley, for all your hard work. I know you're on the call now, and uh, we're hoping that you're still going to be uh, engaged and involved. But I just wanted to say uh, from myself and Cosmic, thank you so much for everything you've done. Yeah, big thank you. Thumbs up uh, to Stanley for all of his hard work. Thank you so much. Any other updates, Chris? All right, so uh, in, in terms of some other Cosmic updates uh, from my side, uh, I've got two donation announcements to share. Um, we're very grateful to SFU and SFU Covnet uh, because they provided us with workspace in their downtown campus. And you'll hear more about how we're putting that space to use when we get an update from the clinical respiratory support team. And secondly, I'm very pleased uh, to share that we've received a $2,000 donation in the last month for Cosmic from a donor that wishes to remain anonymous. So uh, please join me in uh, thanking her for her generosity. Um, I, I, I really, you know, it's wonderful to have that kind of support. And I just wanted to highlight that the donor felt compelled uh, to donate because she wanted to lend her support uh, to the response to glo the COVID-19 global pandemic. And she identified that making a donation to Cosmic would be a great way to do that. And as I look around at all of you on, on my virtual uh, you know, screen or in this virtual meeting room, and as I anticipate the updates that we'll hear about today, I'm confident that our donation is in good hands and uh, it will make a meaningful difference in the world. And the donor highlighted that uh, in her view, the pandemic has caused significant anxiety for many people. And she's keen for us to find ways to lessen the anxiety associated with COVID. And in particular, she believes that the bubble helmet will reduce the anxiety of patients in respiratory distress because they will, they will get respiratory support and, better, and be better able to breathe. So uh, thanks again to our anonymous owner. As Chris alluded to, we continue to um, you know, recruit volunteers. So we need help vis-a-vis -vis actual recruiting and onboarding, media relations, fundraising, operations, social media, outreach, uh, and engineering. And in particular, the CRS team is looking for a chemical engineer that's an expert on zeolite absorption and absorption connect. connect. So please sign up via our website. And as Stanley is transitioning out of his position, we're looking to recruit an executive director for Cosmic. And if this is something that's of interest to you, please sign up on the website and also reach out uh, directly to myself. Uh, other exciting updates is that uh, Gabriel G Galand and team continue to be working on a documentary about Cosmic and the open source movement in general. I've seen a few of those clips and they look great. And uh, I'd also like to share that today at this meeting, uh, we're fortunate to have uh, Ms. John, Jen Arnold, Director of Innovations at the Canadian Medical Association, uh, join us. And Dr. Daniel Kraft, Chair of the XPRIZE Pandemic Alliance Task Force, with, which launched the COVID testing XPRIZE, um, which has since had hundreds of teams sign up from around the world 
um, has also kindly um, said that he's going to join the meeting. But without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to uh, our international outreach team for an update. Hello all. Um, so thanks, thank you very much, Stanley, for uh, doing some amazing work there and it, your work and you will be missed from the team. Um, just some updates about uh, the outreach. Uh, most of our work about outreach was region, uh, region specific. And so far it was targeted towards connecting with the local doctors, research groups, manufacturers and decision makers. Uh, we have had uh, success in Brazil with regards to the snorkel mask. Uh, with regards to India, we are, in, we are currently in talks with one of the largest hospital chains in India and uh, manufacturers to locally produce the bubble helmets. Um, our experiences so far tell us that more uh, efforts are needed from taking our designs from GitHub to the manufacturers and from manufacturers to the patients in need, of course. So we're in the process of reassessing our uh, volunteer resources, uh, brainstorming new ideas and reorganizing our strategies so that uh, we'll hopefully find the right model uh, for more efficient op operation of uh, outreach. So that's all from outreach. Uh, Philip, there's no audio. Uh, I was just saying thank you so much for that update uh, from the International Outreach Group. And we're going to turn now to our biomedical engineering project, starting with uh, Alex Waslin, uh, who's going to give us an update about the GVENT project. And do you see my screen right now, Alex? Yeah, I can see it. Thanks, Phil. Uh, it's actually going to be Patrick who's going to be giving the GVENT. Ah, you're right. Sorry, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Hey, everyone. I'm here to give a quick update about the GVENT. So GVENT stands for Gravity Ventilator. And uh, in response to the COVID pandemic, we found the need for uh, rapidly manufacturable ventilation systems. And GVENT was a unique response. Um, most ventilators use a kind of accordion mechanism um, uh, as a bag that, that transfers the oxygen to the patient's lungs. But GVENT uh, uses two cylinders and a water-based system to deliver constant pressure. So as you can see in the image on screen, there are weights atop a, uh, a cylinder full of oxygenated air, and those weights uh, deliver constant pressure through a system of valves that are controlled. So our team has been uh, really, really making a lot of progress on the documentation and control system side of the project lately. Um, and without getting too technical, um, we'll go to the next slide. Um, we have been redeveloping our software process to have better documentation, um, which includes the system level specification. So that's kind of the really high level, um, what a clinician would see if you were to look at the kind of specs of this system. So when you, when you show up, the system shall do this, the, the system shall deliver um, a constant pressure between 10 and uh, 40 centimeters water to the patient's lungs, things like this. And um, that is now live on GitHub. We're updating it and that will be the kind of source of truth as we continue with the software um, that controls. Then another big update this week, um, the platform and hardware testing is well underway and we are validating that all the components work. Um, we're, we're, we've been taking a modular approach um, so that we can separate the software level requirements from the hardware level from the actual physical build of the system. And that's been really effective so that we're not um, accidentally undoing process as we make changes uh, as we go along. And so you can see the software process below. Um, this week, we're also going to be relocating to a new location so that we can set up all the test uh, equipment that is necessary to validate the system. Uh, which is really important for ensuring that the system works the way that we claim it does. So we'll be setting up the test lung, the air supply unit, care of another Cosmic team. Thank you, Bruce, uh, shout out. And uh, the vent monitor. So vent mon system from 
uh, public invention, they shipped us a unit and that will help to validate that the Gvent system works um, and achieves all of the claims that we've made in the system level specification. So I think this has been a, a, a really solid uh, few weeks for Gvent as we flesh out our documentation um, and develop some more robust processes to make sure that we're building a really safe device. Uh, thank you so much for that update, Patrick, and uh, we'll stay tuned for sure. Uh, next, we're going to move on and we're going to hear from uh, our next team, which is the Bubble Helmet. And I think we're going to hear from Arpan Grover uh, about the Bubble Helmet. Yeah, uh, thanks, Philip. Um, I wasn't able to add to these slides. Um, I was only a viewer, but I have my own. Can I share my screen? Absolutely. Yeah, go for it. Okay, can you guys all see that? Yep. Great, so I'm Arpin. I'm one of the co-leads with the Project Bubble, Project Bubble Helmet. Um, so just to give an overview of what the Bubble Helmet is, it's a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, ventilation system. And it has been shown to improve patient outcomes to reduce um, acute respiratory distress syndrome from University of Chicago through some studies they have done. Um, it, it also optimizes healthcare resources by utilizing um, oxygen, CPAP, and BiPAP. And this will ultimately increase ventilator reserves because less people will need ventilation. And it also uh, reduces the infection risk for healthcare workers by reducing the aerosolization caused by typical CPAP or BiPAP masks. Um, just a quick overview of what the bubble helmet is uh, and move on. So this is our current design of the bubble helmet. So it's just a clear hood and a clear neck seal all made of the same material, the TPU. And there's two ports, one for inflow, which will take uh, wall oxygen or CPAP or BiPAP. And then um, the expiratory port will be attached to um, a PEEP valve where it'll maintain a constant pressure. So over the past couple of weeks, we've been in contact with VGH and we've also been trying to get the helmets manufactured. So one of our bigger updates was that we got in touch with Dr. Finlayson at VGH and he tried on our helmet and he was quite happy with it. He tested it out and as you can see, he has a big smile in his face. Um, yeah, so this could potentially lead to a mini pre-trial before the actual clinical trials, which will happen much later um, after we flushed out some documentation and ethics applications. But yeah, this will be the... Um, have potential mini pretrial if the VGH doctors and nurses are willing to kind of test it out, um, just a small batch that so would be like 15 to 20 units, but it's, it's uh, still in discussion. So that's what we've been doing for the past month. We've also just been um, trying to figure out the little details of how to improve the helmet, but it's been, it's definitely been quite slow because we've all been transitioning into our uh, normal lives and work and school and all that. Yeah, I think that's all from our side for now. And just you feel free to ask any questions uh, later on. You can just send me a message or email. Okay, thank you so much uh, for the update, Arfan. Can you stop sharing your screen? Yes, I can. Uh, it's exciting to hear that uh, we're getting uh, buy-in from our collaborators at uh, VGH, certainly. And now I'm going to try to share my screen, uh, but our next pr presenter is going to be Abhijit from the uh, Clinical Respiratory Support System. And I will figure out how to share the screen while you get started, Abhijit. Yeah, I think uh, this uh, we started this uh, oxygen concentrator project. And I think Bruce is going to talk about uh, some of the 
uh, unique factors about uh, oxygen concentrator and its operation. So Bruce, if you could take it from here. Um, hi, the, um, in a lot of parts of the world, there's an acute shortage of oxygen for treatment of COVID. Now oxygen is, is probably the most basic and widespread uh, treatment modality. Um, uh, in industrial areas like capital cities, it can be provided uh, by big industrial plants. But once you get outside the supply radius of uh, heavy oxygen bottles, uh, it's virtually impossible to get oxygen in uh, a lot of parts of the world. Um, so uh, we would like to be able to make a, an oxygen concentrator that concentrates oxygen from the atmosphere and uh, with a design that gives uh, high-end performance with really cheap parts. Uh, the idea, can, idea is that it could be manufactured locally uh, and in application, although each unit is sized to treat one patient, they can be uh, daisy chained together or manifolded to provide an oxygen supply system for, uh, uh, for an entire ward. Um, because um, uh, electricity supply is a critical component of uh, oxygen concentrators, uh, we've, we've gone to a lot of effort to make sure that it's, uh, that it's a very efficient system. Um, the, the technology that's used is um, uh, pressure swing adsorption which has been uh, was patented more than half a century ago. And it's the standard technology used for those little portable oxygen concentrators you see people wheeling around in, uh, uh, in shopping malls. Um, uh, however, we've significantly simplified the, uh, the design. Um, uh, the standard design uses two pressure vessels and eight valves. Uh, ours uses one pressure vessel and one valve. Um, but it does retain the high performance features of the oxygen sensors that drive the timing of the cycles. Um, so uh, uh, right, right now we don't have a model to show you. We have a pile of parts that we've been sourcing uh, and, uh, and drawings to show how they're gonna go together. Um, uh, but we have uh, space to work and parts to put together. So hopefully over the next few weeks, we'll have something that's living and breathing and spewing out oxygen. And I guess here's the uh, timeline to go along with that, hey? Right, so here's the timeline that has uh, shifted from the last time. And uh, uh, we hope to finish it as soon as we can. As you can see from the timeline there, we are, it seems like we are closer to the start than uh, to the end, but majority of the work is uh, actually in uh, preparing the design, doing uh, background research and uh, sourcing the right material. Um, so hopefully after we get the material ready, we'll have our first prototype pretty soon. So. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for that update. And I guess it is a race against time for all of our projects as the second wave seems to be uh, heating up in many parts of the world for uh, COVID-19. So now we're going to turn to our uh, special uh, guest, uh, Mr. Mike Paddock, uh, who will share uh, some thoughts that he had based on the presentations he's seen and also his own experience uh, at, the, at the UNDP and with Engineers Without Borders. So uh, Mike, I'd love for you to uh, take it away, please. Thank you so much, Philip. <clears throat> so uh, just to get some of the formalities out of the way, um, the opinions presented by me tonight are solely my own and do not reflect the official position or, posi or opinions of the United Nations Secretary General or any of the organizations within the United Nations. First of all, just let me congratulate you on all of the previous work you've done and your current work. I've just been really impressed. I sat in on your call, um, last, the last call, and um, I'm really excited to hear that the GVENT, you're moving forward, particularly focusing on documentation, because we all know that that's very important as we go to regulatory approvals. And the bubble helmet um, looks wonderful. Um, you know, one thing we found in Guatemala when we implemented our uh, bubble helmet is that it really did increase the oxygen demand in the hospitals. And, um, and we actually had a little bit of trouble sourcing all the flow meters. So that might be something to keep in mind. 
and um, and your oxygen concentrator, you know, that's spot on. We've all been we've all been uh, trying to get oxygen driven down into the medical profession or facilities. Um, primarily before COVID, it was to fight childhood pneumonia. So this gives us an opportunity to really correct that issue that has been a long standing uh, thorn in our side. So congratulations on working on that. You know, as I've observed the work of many maker spaces and groups, one of the areas I would like to highlight is the business case for the products is just many times overlooked. You know, I know it's fun to work on products, but in the end, we have to remind ourselves that the goal is for them to be manufactured at scale and used. This requires someone to want to purchase and use your product. In fact, I would ask that you keep that in mind from the very beginning of all of your projects. We are seeing various procurement methods now in low and middle income countries. That's the work that, that I'm kind of focused on. You know, some countries are using a centralized approach where the national ministry will procure the items and then distribute them throughout the network. Um, they do this to be able to allocate resources to hotspots. But others are still using hospitals that will do their own procurement. Um, it's kind of nice because it puts them um, in charge of their own uh, destiny, if you will, drives down the decision making. But it can also lead to competition between healthcare facilities that can be problematic. So it's just really important to know who your customer is going to be for your product in the country that you're, that you're targeting. I also wanted to touch base on regulatory approvals because we're seeing some changes there. You know, in the early days, we saw approvals coming much quicker and many countries gave medical profession, professionals really broad powers to use their best judgment in the time of the crisis. Unfortunately, some bad actors kind of took advantage of the situation and started to make substandard products that not only were up, not up to snuff, but even violated the basic premise of do no harm. Because of these bad apples, the whole purchasing process for local items is now under much tighter scrutiny. This also includes funds used for purchasing of products. Again, a few bad actors have brought more oversight to the whole area of local um, production. We are now seeing procurement departments shine away from local producers because they feel they cannot trust the product or the exchange of funds. In many countries, we are seeing one level of approval needed for items that may be purchased and used by nonprofits and donated to healthcare facilities. And then another whole level of approval, much higher level of approval needed to use public funds to purchase items. For example, in Guatemala, the country that I started working on the COVID response back in March, it now takes 80, 80 separate approvals within the Guatemalan government to make one single purchase due to concerns over corruption. It's just mind boggling. Lastly, I wanted to highlight the need for maintenance supply chain, both technicians and parts. Again, using Guatemala as an example, we saw nearly half of the ventilators in hospitals were non-functional. The biggest challenge was when the don ventilators were donated by someone who was well-intentioned to the facility, but the supply chain for parts was not established. Now we started a program where we make parts, um, out-of-date parts using 3D printing or possibly making adapters so that we can use parts that are available and use them on those vents. So keep in mind how those parts and repairs will be made once your product is put into service. One approach that I really kind of liked was um, in South Africa, where a maker partnered with a local appliance manufacturer to make ventilators. This ensures that the access to parts and technicians using the existing appliance store network across the whole nation was established. I thought that was a neat idea. Finally, one of the bright spots of the pandemic is how makers around the globe, like yourselves, have responded to this challenge. The power of local volunteers working together has been amazing. And I think it shows how this can contribute to the response, not only for this pandemic, but also in the future for other global, global events. So I encourage you to continue your efforts. I know that it's hard, 
I know there's a lot of com competition for your time and it can be really frustrating, but it's only through groups like yours that we will see local manufacturing of medical devices and PPE that will really make the world more resilient. So thank you so much for your, for your efforts. And I don't know if we have time for a few questions, Philip. I absolutely, I think we can, uh, if there are any comments or questions, that would be great. Uh, it's really uh, quite sobering to hear that there's now 80 uh, different levels uh, of approval required in, in certain jurisdictions. Uh, and it, it does obviously highlight some of the challenges that we're facing as an open source group is how do we establish that trust and, and give people the sense that they can use uh, some of our uh, devices uh, and so thank you for highlighting uh, that, that issue. Are there any questions or comments for Mike? I have one. I'm just wondering if, if there are any integrated efforts from um, say all the open source communities uh, to somehow engage um, decision makers in the process uh, and then perhaps uh, because it seems like there is a lot of uh, noise in decision making which one which product is good or not so I just wanted to see uh, if there are any integrated efforts in that direction. Yeah that's a great question and for the pandemic the UN formed a, a new group it's called the Technology Access Partnership I'm going to throw a link into uh, the chat so you guys can take a take a look at that. And what this is is it's a um, it's a a combination of several different UN entities. It's the World Health Organization, UNITAD, which is the trade group, and then also uh, UNDP is involved. And they've come together really with a focus on um, accessing technologies from developers like you to seekers in countries, making that match, but also evaluating those products so that uh, they can move forward with some level of confidence. And the goal is to, to uh, spark some local manufacturing of these products and also give some more confidence to donors, you know, like the global donors, let's say like you know, uh, DFID or UK Aid and, and GIZ and others to invest in local um, manufacturers instead of just using the uh, broken supply chain of using international. So you might want to check, check out the Technical Access Partnership. It's a place where you can actually submit your, uh, your products um, so that it's on the list and can be considered for uh, those that are maybe seeking products like yours. Thank you for that comment. I think that's very much actionable for all of our projects, uh, checking out the techaccesspartnership.net portal. Uh, with that, uh, I think I'm going to say thank you very much, Mr. Paddock, for joining us, uh, for your comments and also your inspiring message uh, about uh, you know, encouraging us as makers uh, to keep working and overcoming these hurdles to ultimately you know, make a difference uh, in this global pandemic. So that now brings us everyone uh, to the end of our meeting. Uh, I just wanted to share my screen one more time here. Uh, that was Mr. Paddock. And I would also encourage you guys, if you haven't already, to check out his book about bridging barriers. Um, and that's it for our meeting uh, for COSMIC. So please feel free to sign up. Uh, I mean, sign off. We're gonna stop the recording now, stop the Facebook Live. Uh, thread and then we're going to switch into an, an 